This is a technical video on SonicWall Single Sign-On SSO for short with on-prem Active Directory. SSO is designed to automatically authenticate users and IP addresses going through the firewalls to find out who's the user using that IP, it belongs to which group, and then apply policy accordingly. So that is kind of part two video. So that's how to turn on single sign-on only. Active Directory integration is in a different video. I'll put a link in the description box down below. But if you do want single sign-on and you haven't done Active Directory integration first, well, stop right here, go in the description box down below and start with the integration of Active Directory, then come back here. I believe single sign-on is a key feature for network security. So we'll first explain how it works, then we'll set it up and we'll finish by implementing security policies because it goes way further than simply having a login report with Active Directory username rather than IP addresses. Of course, there is the convenience of being able to set content filtering based on Active Directory groups. So you can say marketing and HR do need social media for marketing and hiring purposes, so we'll give them access and everybody else no social media. So that's the kind of thing you can do with Active Directory integration, which is great. But there is also key security features. For instance, if you do have a business that has a assembly chain and you do have some network equipments that control those assembly chain devices, you may want to say only engineering can access to those devices because the assembly chain is the money making machines of your organization, right? So you want to have a type control over who do things in there so you can leverage single sign on for this or server servers and switches. You can say only IT can do remote desktop on servers and can do SSH to switches, for instance, right? HR, finance, R&D, they have nothing to do to connect SSH to switches. So those are the type of stuff you can do. And I'll also show that you, something else I suggest is to not give internet access or just give no access to unauthenticated machines, right? Because if I don't know who you are, why would I give you access to anything? So that's something you can also leverage a single sign on for. Hi, I'm Jean-Pierre Talbot, SE for SonicWall in Canada, helping customer and reseller get the most out of their network security solutions. If you're new here, make sure you hit the subscribe button and have a look in the description box down below because often I'll put links to things I mentioned and maybe some extra content as well. So let's play with authentication. I have a little quiz for you. Which car will go the fastest around a racetrack? my modified 600 horsepower Porsche 911 Turbo, or my very dirty Hyundai Ionic Electric. Which one? Fastest around the track, Porsche, Hyundai? Well, if you insert the Porsche, sorry, wrong answer. Cars don't drive themselves. You need a good driver as well. And if you put my girlfriend behind the wheels of the Porsche, well, it's a st the car is stick. She can't drive stick. She doesn't know what to do with a third pedal on this thing. So I will win with my small electric car. Second question for you, which type of firewall will provide the best security for your organization? Home grade type of firewall like D-Link and Linksys? Or business grade type of firewall like SonicWall, Fortinet, Palo Alto, Checkpoint, WatchGuard and so forth? Which one? Business grade? Home grade? Sure you understand what is the answer to this? You need a good driver there as well. You need someone that know what it does. So if you again give a business grade firewall to my girlfriend and you give me the home grade firewall, I will probably be do better with the home grade firewall because I will take full use of the three features they have, right? So again, key feature is to know what you do and use the features to their full extent. So I keep dwelling pretty much every single video. I keep dwelling over and over again about network segregation to separate stuff in your organization. And just last week was another good example. I had a call from a customer, everything got encrypted. They had one big network, everything was in it, including the backup server. So one machine got to run somewhere, no clue how. If infected everything, all servers, including the backup server. So they've been down, it's been three weeks. So network segregation is key to have different blocks in your network. Those things, those things, those people and this. Well, you can go even further with what we'll cover today, which is single sign on. So not only I can say the HR network, but I can also say 
the people working for HR, those that are a member of the HR group, those individuals do have those access. So that's even going further than network segregation. You're doing per user type of access, which is even better if implemented well. Because if you think about it, I'm sure you guys already do this. You have a file server and you have a finance folder and only people member of the finance group can access the finance folder. I'm sure you've been doing that for decades. So HR cannot get into finance file because they're not member of finance. The exact same thing apply on the network level. Why would someone in HR have network connectivity access to a finance server or service? This is the exact same apply. I get that they maybe don't have credentials to connect, but why would they just have the opportunity to have network access to the thing, right? So you should control which people from which group have access to what in your organization. So if someone in HR ever get a run somewhere and you have have strong network segregation and you've used single sign-on and they only have access to their stuff, well, the ransomware will have the impact of no payroll this Thursday, but everything else will keep working. The phone will keep working. Account receivable will keep working. The assembly chain will keep working. So, you know, you will have contained the issue just to HR and not have one big network with no control whatsoever. And you infect absolutely everything and you go down for weeks. So much better to control what you give access to people and single sign on is a great way to do it in conjunction with uh, network segregation. So that's what we'll cover. And we'll also go at uh, only giving access to internet to devices that we've been able to authenticate and also the convenience of being able to do content filtering based on active directory groups. That's something we will do as well. So how single sign on works. So the way it works, you have a machine or different machines in your network that trying to get to the internet. So their traffic hit the firewall because firewall is default gateway and firewall will look like, okay, I got a communication coming from 192.168.1.73 that wants to go on Google or YouTube, whatever it is. Firewall will be like, well, I don't know who's the user on 192.168.1.74. It's going to ask the single sign-on agent, a use single sign-on agent. I would like to know who's the user on 192.168.1.74. Single sign-on agent has two options. First one is to connect to the domain controller and check for login and log off event to find out who logged in on 192.168.1.74. And the second option is to connect on the machine itself, 192.168.1.74, and find out who's the user logged in directly on the machine instead of looking at the uh, domain controller logs. So th those are the two options that the single sign-on agent have and we'll configure both because it's kind of nice to both for both to work. So once the single sign-on agent find out that David is connected on this IP, it will reply to the firewall, AU firewall. The question is, your question for who's the user on 192.168.1.74, the user is Dave. Firewall will, I guess, say thank you. And then the firewall will connect in Active Directory to find out Dave is a member of which group. And for we will get the information and then apply policy accordingly. So that's how single sign-on works. Important point for single sign-on, you do not need an agent on every single workstation. You need at least one agent on a member server. Personally, I always suggest to not install it on the domain controller, but use any other domain member server to install the single sign-on agent. And of course, it could be a good idea to have two single sign-on agent, one on each server in case something happened to one server, you still want some sort of redundancy for single sign-on. So again, do not need the agent on every single workstation. You need at least one agent on one domain member server for it to work. So for single sign-on to work, we do have a few steps that we need to take. The first one is to play with GPOs because group policies, because the first one we need to do is handle Windows firewall, right? Remember I told you the single sign-on agent has two options. First is to look at Active Directory and second is to look at the machine itself to find out who's the user on it. Well, if on the target machine Windows firewall is on, guess what will happen? It's not going to work. So first we will have to deal with Windows firewall. We'll do that through GPOs. 
And the second GPO we need to do is to turn on advanced auditing so that the Windows Active Directory server is keeping track and log into the security event thing, uh, users that have logged in and log out. So we can query those uh, security log to find out who's on. So first thing to do is GPOs. And next thing is to download the single sign-on agent, install it, configure it, and also to connect to the firewall and do the configuration for the SSO agent. Just basically tell firewall if the single sign-on agent is there, right? Nothing more than that. Then of course we need to test. You need to test stuff that it works. We'll need to test if the single sign-on agent is able to read uh, in through DC logs and also to query machines to find out who's the user in there. So I'll show you how to test both. Then we will do policies. As I mentioned, we'll do content filtering policies. We'll do policies to uh, access the internet, to just give ac internet access, and also to access different resources within your network. And I'll finish off briefly by showing that the analytics software you can buy with SonicWall, which is a VM, on-prem, or cloud, will actually be able to show you reports, including username, which is pretty convenient. So let's do this. Okay, so like I said earlier in the video, uh, this is the second portion of authentication. So the first one uh, is about Active Directory, Active Directory integration. And here I assume you've already watched that video and you already configured Active Directory integration. So I will review br uh, briefly what I've done for Active Directory. I will show the setup I have and then we'll move on. So first thing here, we'll go check the firewall we have. So CX0 is 10.6.254.1. Next, let's look at my Active Directory server here. As you can see, it is 10.6.254.3, so same subnet. And the firewall is the default gateway.1. And we have the workstation here. IP is in the same subnet, and it's .220. And obviously, default gateway is the firewall.1 here. Then we'll look at my Active Directory here. So as you can see, that is my domain, murdusson.ca. I have two users, JP and Rob. I have three groups, sales, where Rob is member of it, and tech, where JP is member of this group. And I believe I have another one, yep, network user. So that one, everyone is member of it. So JP and Rob are both member of network user. So that is my overly complex Active Directory here. And next, I want to show you roughly the Active Directory integration. It's already done. So if I click on configure LDAP here, we do see my Active Directory server is here. TLS is on and if I hit on test, it works. It is able to connect and it can uh, search for username and return me that this user is member of those groups here. So Active Directory integration is done and working. So next is to turn on Active Directory uh, single sign-on integration because it's nice users can now log in to the firewall using their Active Directory credentials. But now I want that process to be automatic. So if someone inside trying to get to the internet, the firewall will do magics and find out that this IP address is this user member of those groups. So I want that to be a automatic process. So first thing we need to do, like I mentioned earlier, the first step is to do some GPO. So we'll go in Active Directory. And GPOs are, I'm not a Active Directory guy, sorry. Group policy. Okay, and the default one is here. So there is a knowledge base on SonicWall, which I don't have here. I'll put the link in the description box down below, but here it is, SonicWall single sign-on advanced auditing. So I'm gonna click on this one. I'll, again, I'll be nice with you guys. I'll put the link in the description box down below. So that's something I like about SonicWall KB. They have pictures and everything, and it's step-by-step -step easy to get through things. So you do need to turn to have a GPO to turn on different things that are listed here. So, you know, we want the event 4624 in security uh, event of Active Directory, and you need to go in the GPO, computer config, policies, Windows settings, security settings, advanced editing, editing, blah, blah, blah. And you see all the one that you need to turn on. So I'll just show you 
on my Active Directory. So that's into Group Policy Manager under my domain, edit the default domain policy, make this bigger and I believe it is here. If memory serves me well. Yep, I think it is. So see, I got those two that I edit success. And on ear, ear. I got two ear, login and log off, just like the KB asked for. And I got uh, that one too. I don't think that one is part of the um, of the knowledge base. Actually, I can turn it off. I was testing on stuff. So you don't need this. And yep, that's it. So I've done my group policy here. And the other one, I kind of feel ashamed to say that, but I tried as best as I can to uh, deal with Windows firewall, the Microsoft firewall on Windows uh, machines, because I needed to do a uh, rules to allow my single sign-on agent to talk to the workstation on port 135, 139, and 445. So I would, I was in need for a firewall rules on all Windows machines to allow 135, 137, and 445 TCP from the IP address where I will install my single sign-on agent. I spent an entire evening trying to figure it out the Windows firewall and get it to work. I miserably failed, so I just turned it off. Of course, I cannot really recommend turning Windows firewall off. So you guys, I assume you guys know more about Microsoft than I do. I'm much better. I'm, my skills are much better with uh, Sonic Wall than it is with Microsoft. So I'll let you deal with Windows firewall, but we'll talk about um, um, we'll talk about it when I install the single sign-on agent. But uh, there are different ways that the single sign-on agent can get the username uh, on a machine that is connected. And the first one is to look at uh, edit login and log off event in the domain controller. And the second one is to ask the machine directly, which requires 135, 130, 135, 139, and 445 to be open. And again, I failed at doing it. So somewhere in group policies, I turned off Windows Firewall. So not something I would advise. If you can figure it out how to open the port I mentioned and um, not turn off Windows Firewall. So once you've done the policy in Windows Firewall or turn, turn it off, next you need to do GP update slash force. So that force your Active Directory controller to refresh its policy. Okay, so now our group policies are updated. So one thing you I would advise to do is do this ahead of time because now you know I've told Active Directory through a GPO I want you to log log in and log off event. Well, if a machine is already logged in, it's not going to go back in time and generate yourself a login event, right? So you'll need people to log off and log back in, and then you'll get an event in Active Directory that says that this user logged in. So don't be, don't, don't, don't freak out if you realize that single sign-on doesn't work quite well at the beginning. You will need people to log off and log back in. So if you do this a few days ahead of time, then chances are that all workstation will have reboot and you'll have plenty of um, of login and log login and log off event or another trick just a joke um, turn off the main of the electrical panel everything will go off just kidding um, next so we've done GPO again that was to turn on uh, login and log off event through the KB I have here and we've took care of Windows firewall on the workstation as well. Okay, next is to download our single sign-on agent. Here I will do things that, uh, things with the S, things that I always strongly suggest you never do. The first one, I will use my domain controller to browse the web and go download the single sign-on agent. So servers are not workstation, in my own opinion, I used to when I was an IT consultant, all servers did not add internet access, period. It's servers are not a workstation, period. That's it. You don't browse the web through a server. So here I'm 
gonna go against my own policy. It's just a lab here, so no big deal. And the second thing I will do that I usually advise people to not do, I will install the SunEqual single sign-on agent directly on my Active Directory server. So generally for me, rule of thumb, don't install anything on your Active Directory server. Um, but here I'm gonna go against that. I don't have tons of servers. So here I would suggest that you use a another server that is member of your domain uh, member of your domain and install the active directory uh, single sign on agent on that member server and not directly on active directory so here i will go against both rule and use my active directory server to browse the web and get the single sign on agent and i will install it directly on active directory so i'll let you guys decide how you want to do those so to download the single sign-on agent, you go on mysonicwall.com, log in with your credential, go into download center. I don't know why it do that for me. It always pick French. So go English and find something called directory uh, service connector. And rule of thumb, always pick the more, the most recent version which is 4119 and expand this year. In my case, I will pick the 64 bit version. So downloading this file and running it on the server where I want to install single sign on. Of course, bed reading, right? Need to read all this. We always do. Next. Domain name in my case, like I showed you here, my domain is muraldusson.ca. So typing it here. Here we need to give a username that this e the, the service will use. Here I will just pick the domain admin. Uh, username and password. I will put a link in the description box down below for <clears throat> a KB that lists, you know, which users and group mem which group membership it needs. In my case, I just go with admin. IP address of the firewall. So like I showed you here, firewall IP address is 10.6.254.1. So the SonicWall appliance port leave it by default. And now we need to provide a shared key. And it says here, please enter a even number of digit and use between zero and nine and A to F. So I will do A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, F, F. So just keep that in mind. Next and install. And we'll launch the Active Directory connector thing. So see, it is trying to connect. It will not succeed because that key AABBDDFF that I've input, I need to do it on the firewall as well so that both are happy and will talk. So it's not done yet. So that thing will either remain at connecting or eventually go to fail unless until I uh, configure it on the firewall. So domain controller, I like, I like it. See, auto discovery, you hit this and boom, it's done. Connecting, eventually it will say connected. Here we do have other stuff like terminal server, exchange, novel, and other remote agents. So those are single sign-on agent you could eventually install on your exchange to be able to track phones and things like this. But I must say exchange, I don't see them very often. I see a lot of Office 365. And the same for Novell. So uh, I will not touch on those, but at least now you know that they do exist. And see if I go back on domain controller, now it's saying connected. So we're happy. Next, single sign-on agent here. We'll go through the different stuff we have. So we have status, how many requests have been done. Not much yet, of course. Properties, here there is not a lot to do. I like checking this one, uh, preserve users during restart. So if you restart that agent, the users will be preserved. So it's kind of nice. And that's pretty much it. 
on things you need to do here. Nothing here. Diagnostic tool will go back there eventually. Users and host. See, it already flagged two machines. Uh, so itself, right? 10.6.254.3 is my domain controller, the machine on which we are now. And single sign-on already know that admin administrator is logged in through DC security logs. And we have one machine that already shows because of DC security log. So that's a good thing. That's because our GPO actually worked. Uh, we could exclude user if we want and static user. I could input an IP address and say this IP address is this user. So it's always going to be that user for that IP. So as you can see, pretty straightforward for the configuration of our uh, single sign-on agent, right? So in Koala appliance, it's still saying connecting because we haven't configured the firewall yet. Domain controller, we've hit auto discovery and we're done. And here, what I've personally done in SSO agent and properties was to hit this and forgot to hit accept. So you need to hit accept, otherwise it doesn't work. It's crazy, eh? And that's done. Good. So our single sign-on agent is configured. One thing I would advise is if you do have a, an environment where you have a lot of users and uh, also if you want redundancy, which is always nice, I would advise to install another single sign-on agent on another server, right? So if that one server goes down, well, your single sign-on is still going to work because you have two servers. So next is to go on the firewall and configure uh, where are my single sign-on agents. So in my case, I will only install one agent, but I'm sure you can understand where it will be, where you need to install, uh, configure a second one. So you would, you know, pick another server, we run through that exact same wizard on a s another server. Okay. And now that is the end of the configuration for the SSO agent itself. Now is time to move to configuring the firewall itself. So firewall is a TZ470. Sonic OS 701 at the moment of filming, that's the latest firmware available. Go into device, users, and settings. So see again here, Active Directory is already set up. So if that again is not done, stop here. Don't try to set up single sign-on. The step I'm about to do, it will not work, guaranteed. So next we need to turn on single sign-on agent. Hit accept, go into single sign-on, and click on configure, we need to add the agent. So if you've deployed three agents on three different servers, you need to click add agent three times and add all three. In my case, I only have one, so I will add one. IP of it, it's the IP where I have installed my single sign-on agent. So remember, it is installed here, and that machine has the IP.3. And the pre-shared key, AA. B B C C D D E E F F A A B B C C D D E E F F. And that's it. IP address. Don't change the port and the key. Hit on save. It's gonna show down eventually within a couple seconds. Here we go. It shows up and running. Here we do have settings here you can put your mouse over it with that small i and actually learn on stuff personally i went through them i leave them as is good for me enforcement per zone single sign on enforcement you'll show you'll see later when i'll go into status we have active users and inactive user so Inactive users are users that have been authenticated, but the firewall see no use for them. So it doesn't move them as active user because you're not using that user for Active Directory, uh, for um, content filtering access, like do content filtering for the HR group in Active Directory, which would trigger a user to move to a active user or just access rules that uh, are based on users or Active Directory groups. So if nothing, is used for a specific user, it's going to stay in inactive users. So if you do turn it on here, like do this, then it will uh, move every single users to active users. Um, I will just leave it off to show you different things. Here we do have SSO bypass. So bypass is simply to tell the firewall, do not try and authenticate uh, anything in that network or that service or things like this. So here, 
I have LAN where all my Active Directory machines are, right? And those are the thing I want to authenticate. But in my house, I have IoT zone where the TV is, the PlayStation, the Apple TV, and all those gizmos. So it could kind of be your guest Wi-Fi in your in your environment, right? So if you have a customer that shows up with their iPhone, connect on your guest Wi-Fi while they're waiting in line, whatever it is. It's useless for your firewall to try to authenticate those users, right? They're not on your domain, so it will always fail. Just like the PlayStation in my house, it's not member of the domain, right? So it's useless for the firewall to try to find out who's the user, who's the Active Directory user on my PlayStation. So that's where SSO bypass uh, can be handy, right? So I'm gonna click on Add Bypass. It's not a service. I want addresses to be in exceptions. And I know that my um, guest Wi-Fi, my IoT zone, sorry, is on XX VLAN 1008. So I'm going to add the entire subnet of VLAN uh, 1008 because it's my IoT. So in your case, it could be your guest Wi-Fi, for instance, and I'm going to do a full bypass. So I'm telling the firewall, do not even try to authenticate users on this subnet. So see here, it is added here. Then we have terminal server and other stuff we won't play with today. So see, my SSO agent is up and running. So next, of course, is to test, right? If you have, if you set up things and you don't test it, well, it's not a feature, it's a wish list, just like backup, right? If you're never trying to restore your backups, you don't have backup, you have a wish list. So we'll test connectivity with my single sign-on agent. It works. So that's good. Next, we'll try with a workstation to find out if we're able to authenticate a user on a workstation. So here we'll log in. Just gonna do a log off and log back in to be sure. Sign out, because I don't remember if I logged in before creating the GPO or after, so I will just log out and back in. Okay, so I'm logged in as JP on this workstation. And it has the IP220, I believe. We'll just confirm that. Yep, IP 10.6.254.220. So check user. So we have two things we can check. We can check from domain controller. Remember I told you we can look at the domain controller login and log off event, or we can check directly on the workstation. It's using net API or WMI. So in my case, I will say test with domain controller and domain controller return JP. So one out of two that are working. Next, we'll test directly works with the workstation. Remember, I said I've turned off Windows Firewall. So now what's going to happen is my single sign-on agent will try to connect directly on the machine on port 135, 139, and 445 to find out who's the user. So it on test, and it returns JP is logged in. So both are working. So I'm happy. So it on save. Then we could go in status. See, user is not there. And user is part of the user JP that I've been logged in a minute ago is now into inactive user because it's not doing anything and I don't have access rules or features like content filtering that use um, single sign-on. See, I can browse the web with this machine. Let's go on Ford website. So I'm able to get to Ford website and I hit refresh and I'm still an inactive user simply because I have no access rule, no content filtering, no feature that requires this to work. So one thing I could do, remember here in configure SSO, I said you could go in enforcement and turn this on. That would move everyone to active users. So that's one thing you can do if you want. Or the next thing we will do is to do policies with um, active directory groups or use features as well. Uh, before I move on, I want to show different tabs here. Um, there are things you may want to look into. Authentication bypass user session. See here, 
if single sign-on failed to identify a user, it will log the user as unknown SSO fail. And for connection that have a bypass SSO, it's gonna log unknown SSO bypass, right? And of course you do have small uh, piece of text here that explain what are those, but to me the default were fine. So next is to do access rules and use features with um, single sign-on. One thing I took note that I want to mention, you may see that you will have issues sometimes with single sign-on, right? You may see like, oh, okay, I have 150 employees and I have 148 that shows up. So that is a thing I've realized that when a workstation is off for a very long time, like several months, maybe a year, um, there is some issues with Active Directory, like this, the workstation is still a member of the domain, but there is like trust relationship in Active Directory that are broken, that has nothing to do with SonicWall. So if you have issues where all, almost all workstations are there, some are not there, take those workstations, remove them from the domain, re-add them to the domain. What I've seen uh, in the past, my past experience is someone that went on parental leave, like mom or dad that took several months off to take care of their newborn baby. They were off for many, many months the workstation is kind of no more on the domain, sort of. So just take it off of the domain and put it back on. And usually that fix single sign-on. Next is to do access rules. So first thing we can do, remember, see here, I have created a policy for my Active Directory server here, Active Directory, to go out on specific DNS and only on DNS protocol, right? Because that's a video I've done. You need to tightly control what people do outside and control internet access. So here I have a policy that open all ports for anyone. And now what I will do, I will change it and go into user TCP and include only a group called network user. So all my employees are a member of that group. So that's one thing that I believe is key um, for uh, IT security is to control who has internet access, right? Because if you allow blindly internet access to any device inside your network, like I mentioned in the begin beginning of the video, some pen tests are, uh, are done this way. Someone walk in, find a network jack, plug in a small Raspberry Pi. Well, that small Raspberry Pi is not member of your domain and it's not a user member of this. So that device will not be able to dial out and get internet access and provide connectivity to someone from the outside. So it is key for networking. So here I have my outbound policy. Again, I would advise you open only the ports you need, like I mentioned in my tips and tricks for security, but here for demo purposes, I'll just keep the any. So you need to be member of that group to be able to have internet access. And if you're not member of that group, well, there is no policy to give you any internet access. So let's give this thing a try now. We'll just go on another website, uh, Porsche. And see, it is working. And now my user probably moved from inactive user to active user. See, I'm here. JP is now here and we see that I am member of network user group right here. So that's a way to have, you know, that now the firewall was like, oh, I need, that is an active user. I need its credential and its group to actually uh, give him access to some stuff. So that is one. Next you can do that I like doing uh, is content filtering using active directory groups. So see here, I have two that are for, you know, my own personal use. I have content filtering for the IoT zone and one for the sonic wall zone. I have none for um, the LAN zone. So everything is allowed. So I will create a new one and I will tie it only to um, salespeople. So sales, we'll give it a name, right? Source, it's going to be from the LAN. It's going to the WAN. Source address exclude, we're not going to play with IP addresses. We will play with user groups and I will pick my cell group. 
I'm not going to exclude anyone. Schedule is always on. Profile, I will create a new profile that I will call sales and I will block cars or vehicle. Where are they here? So no car stuff for salespeople. And the deny message will be the same. So see, if you're in the land zone, which is the case for my test machine and you're a member of the sales group, you will not be able to get to car website. And remember, my user JP is not member of the sales group. He's member of tech, right? I'm member of network user and tech. So I will be able to browse car website. So let's go see um, Lambo. I have no clue how to spell it without typos. Lamborghini.com. It works. So now we'll log off with JP and log in with Rob because Rob is member of the sales group and we will try to go on car website. So see if we go back into here, we add JP and if I hit refresh, JP is gone and it's now Rob zero minute ago. And now let's try to get to car website. Uh, Ford. Right, I guess I did not do the HTTPS thing. See here, that's stuff that I've discussed on the um, on my video on content filtering, and I just forgot about it. So need to turn on HTTPS or to turn on DPI SSL, which will not only block on HTTPS, but will also inspect everything. So here I just forgot to do it. So we'll try again. Another brand, uh, GM. See, and it's not working. So we've been able to have content filtering done with access uh, with um, with Active Directory group for content filtering. See here, I got content filtering for my cells group in Active Directory. Another one that I like. So see, when you, I personally like uh, using Active Directory for day-to-day -day stuff that people need all the time, right? You always need access to internet and there is stuff you need all the time. So it's nice to use Active Directory groups to be able to give them access to the thing that they always need. But there are stuff that you very rarely need. And I like to have a second layer of authentication for those one. The, the example I'll use is my VoIP system. So we'll, we'll, we'll go in access rule from LAN to my VoIP system. I have a rule here that give access See what I've done here. So I have a rule that says anyone can connect to my phone system, which is 10.7.254.3. But I've put that use, I've only allowed it for another user, right? It's a local user in the firewall. It's not a active directory user. Let me show you that. So I went into settings, no, your local users. And see, I have JP Talbot as a user local on the firewall, not a active directory user. So just local to the firewall. And I've created a policy that it that user can access this IP address. So see, if I go on that machine, trying to type the IP, it's not working. But what I can do is manually authenticate myself to the firewall. Mm -hmm. 
and I am logged in. And next I can try again. And now I get access. So, you know, for things that you rarely need access to it or something that is very crucial for you and your, your organization, you want no one to be able to access it at any time. But there are, you know, three, four times a year, you do need to get in there and do check a thing and then get off of it. So it is a great way, I believe, to achieve this. So now that, that, that's my phone system. I might want to I don't know, change something in there, add an extension or whatever it is. And once I'm done, I'm just going to log out. So I've completely lost access to anything in that network. So if I ever get a ransomware on my machine, there is no access at all to that subnet. So that part of my network will be completely safe and completely isolated. So it's another thing I like um, to do. And see my single sign-on is also alive. It remained, right? So I've been able to log in to the firewall with single sign-on. So I'm logged in here, but then I've logged in also as another user, which gave me access to stuff. Then when I once I logged off from JP Talbot, I'm still logged back in as being Rob. So um, I love this thing. So again, if you have really specific things that you do need a specific access, works great. Another thing I wanted to show here, I will log out this user. Log out and I'm going to log into the workstation, but not on the domain, just log, log in locally to this machine. So no other user. See here it's saying log into Merle Dusson. So I'm going to do this. See, now I'm logged in directly to the desktop. I'm not logged into the workstation at all. So now I'm logged in to the workstation directly without any Active Directory domain, right? I'm just logged in as a local user to the workstation. So, and as you can see here, I'm not there. There is no JP or Rob in here what i like one thing i would like to show you as well is see here it's an option you may not want to turn it on it's really up to you see if i do from lan to when remember i got that policy is still here if i edit that policy see here I have a checkbox that are not checked but don't invoke single sign-on to authenticate user and don't redirect to don't redirect an authenticated user to login page it is not checked so we'll we'll give this a try so I will use a workstation that is not connected or logged into the domain. And trying to go on a website. See, it wants me to authenticate. And for some reason, it doesn't work with Chrome. I suspect it is just a settings or a security setting of Chrome. So let's try again with uh, Edge. So I need to authenticate, continue. I'll log in as JP because JP has access to car stuff and not Rob. Successfully logged in, hit on continue. And now I have the time I wanted. It's set to unlimited, but I could have set a specific time and I have the option to log out. And now I'm being redirected to a Porsche website. Oh, and Porsche doesn't want me to have a old version of Edge. It wants one of those. So we'll try Ford. And see, I'm able now to browse the web. So there is a feature to redirect a user to authentication page if the user is not authenticated. Personally, I'm not a fan of it. If single sign-on failed to authenticate a machine, it's either because you got something broken on that machine or that this machine is not member of the domain. And if it's not member of the domain, then you don't know if it, the machine is clean or not. So then I don't want it on my network, right? So I have it on the guest Wi-Fi or somewhere else. But, you know, the option is there and I think it's cool. So I wanted to show you the option. So then you decide what you guys want to do with it. And last part I wanted to show you is... 
Analytic, where it's something extra you can buy. It's our log and report solution uh, at SonicWall. So I will show you what it does. So I'm going to pick my firewall here, move this aside. Then we can go, let's say, in analytic, web activity, group. And we see all the web activity for, I don't know, we'll pick the last hour. I can pick users and see we do have user, right? If we've played with Rob, we're trying to go on different websites. So Rob is showing up. And then I can say, show me web activity for Rob. And then it's going to show me everywhere that machine trying to, to go. So we'll probably see GM is here, Ford is here. So we see all the usage for a specific user, which is very nice because if your boss is asking you for, tell me what Rob have been doing on the internet for last week, and you give him a report for 10.6.254.220, it's not the best, right? Management will be like, I ask for Rob, not a bunch of numbers, right? So here, that's kind of cool. You get um, stuff with username. So thanks for your time. I really hope you appreciated that video and you've learned a lot. Go for it. Please use single sign-on. It brings a ton of value and a lot of security. And it is a free feature, right? So just, just do it. So thanks for watching and have a great day.